So can we talk about that? The, the disease of obesity, I don't think my listeners or some of them really appreciate this for what it is. And I have to be honest, I did not appreciate it for what it was until recent years. But I come from a long line of obese folks. And yeah. I think Oprah said it in a way that made the most sense to me. She said, not everyone who's obese has the disease of obesity. And not everybody with a disease of obesity ends up being obese <clears throat> because of just really strict willpower. They somehow they sheer sheer willpower through it. But I think that uh, I think we're missing the mark for folks who really do have the disease. And I think that's what we're battling online. I think that's yeah. the stigma around these peptides it has nothing to do with the peptide. People yeah. are just, you said it in a post, you said you just have obesity bias. And I was like, yep, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much it. And I, you know, I don't even blame, I was just on another podcast. I don't even get mad at these people because I, I had it myself. Like I was a young wrestler, pretty jack dude and been like, why, why aren't these people just like eating better and exercising? Why? It seems like it's just a, they're lazy and gluttonous or something like that. It wasn't until, you know, going through med school and then going to conferences, talking to very smart neurobiology experts and researchers and other obesity doctors, and then talking to patients and really seeing the pattern where I started to understand it. And actually it was when I did a bodybuilding competition and got that brought my calories just to 20. I'm just trying to eat 2200 calories, which is probably what most people would be like, that seems like a lot. I was starving on ah. 2200 calories. And I was I, I couldn't stop myself from eating Pringles and, and it like I it like start kind of having disordered eating like I couldn't I couldn't stop. I was like, I was so ravenously hungry and craving. And I and what my patients described was kind of that so I could imagine them being you know, in a 300 pound or 250 pound body with a lot of excess adipose tissue, trying to lose weight and feeling that way, just that, you know, I was already really lean, but like they're feeling that way at a higher body fat. That's what made me go like, oh man, I think I missed the mark. And so um, there's two different things because there's the, there's people think of the disease in two different ways. The disease, the way the AMA kind of described it back in, in 2013, the criteria of like certain signs and symptoms, certain uh, uh, associated with uh, morbidity, mortality, those types of things like definition of a disease versus the pathophysiology of what drives it. So right now, if you it, there's the Lancet Commission just came out with their whole um, definition of obesity and they tried to describe basically preclinical obesity. So basically people that don't have this, those, those sequela or issues from their excess adipose tissue, they're healthy basically, other than just a lot of adipose tissue. Then they, they talk about clinical obesity and that, that those are people with say like type 2 diabetes or prediabetes hypertension, some issues arising from the excess adipose tissue. So that's how some people talk about the disease of obesity. But what I think you're getting at and what I, I like to talk about is that the pathophysiology of what drives that adipose gain. Why is it that some people, you know, they just change their habits a little bit and lose the weight and never gain it back versus other people, they try to lose the weight and their body fights them tooth and nail and 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 they essentially just cannot lose the weight or keep it off without some extra tool despite their best efforts and all the the amount of effort that they put into it so it's that it's it's that pathophysiology that i think is really what people need to understand because otherwise they just think it's a choice yes like, like you just think it, they're just like i don't understand it's just a calorie deficit well it's like it can't be a disease and it's like well I was, I was like, what is choice? Even if it were a choice, that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean that this person doesn't have a disease. I always, you know, for the bros out there, I'm always like, let's say if you knew that this woman out there had gonorrhea, let's make it really crude, <laughs> and you choose to still have intercourse with her and you, and you get gonorrhea. Do you not have a disease? Because you cho chose that? No, that doesn't even make sense. You got to think of that. that <laughs> you know, so, Good point. So you, and then I, you know, I always talk about like, what about type two diabetes? So we don't think of it that way. Do we say people choose to have type two diabetes? No. So the choice thing doesn't have anything to do with it. But um, going into the pathophysiology, though, it's like, 
how if it truly even if it, like it's not a choice though it's it's not a choice because like people would never choose to have obesity and people are like well it's it's they're choosing the habits they they, they clearly chose uh, an extra serving an extra helping at dinner when they didn't have to it's like no they're it's the underlying appetite dysregulation or derangement that's driving it the biology drives the behavior and of course the environment so like you know Callie means and and all these other people will say like no, we, we don't need drugs. We need to change our environment. We do need to change the environment. The environment will help prevent the obesity from occurring in the first place. But once that obesity develops, their brain is changed. Yes. And it, like Their genes are changed. It. They're, they're yeah. changed at the genetic level. I don't know if you saw that study. I'm sure you did last week. Like, yeah. like actual genetic changes. I mean, it, it's like the train has left the station. Yeah. I, I describe it as like, think about the circuits in our brain and the circuits in our brain control a lot of our processes in our body, one of them being appetite. In a normal brain, uh, that's th someone that doesn't have obesity or, or struggles with their appetite, all the circuits are, are working well. But think about like someone that struggles with their obesity and losing uh, that weight and keeping it off. They're short circuits. They're frayed and fried. And that's why these GLP-1 medicines are so cool because they seem to recircuit the brain in a way that, um, and it, again, it's not necessarily permanent. They recircuits it as long as you're taking the medicines, but it hits the receptors to basically stop the short circuiting of the brain. So that's, so that's the pathophysiology of, of it's, it's really related to appetite. Uh, and, and people are like, but it's just energy balance. I'm like, yeah, the appetite drives the energy balance. Yeah. And so, um, and, that's and the gist. 